Welcome to The Culture Bar, a panel discussion podcast exploring, dissecting and shedding light on important topics in the arts and music world which matter to you. Hello, I'm Fiona Livingston and in this podcast we will be discussing oil and water, can art and digital mix. We are excited to be joined by Laura Hendricks, who is a mixed media artist and lives in Utah, USA. She shares an art studio with her husband, Havoc Hendricks, who is a painter. They have a house cat and a studio cat, and most of Laura's best photographs are from places within just a few hours drive from where she lives. And our second guest is Wells Bray Smith, assistant curator of special projects at Whitechapel Gallery. Wells has held positions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, Pace Gallery, and the Barbican Centre in London, and has worked on exhibitions with international artists, ranging from Turner Prize winner Helen Kamak to Adam Pendleton and Ito Barada. At Whitechapel, she is responsible for curatorial projects, including the Max Mara Art Prize for Women and a new public art commission with the London Borough of Tower Hamlets. She is also curating the next London Open, an open call exhibition for artists working in London. And Wells has also started a new venture called What the F Is This? An Instagram community to work out what contemporary art is, what it says about the world and ourselves, and why it might matter. So welcome to you both. Thank Hi, you, Fiona. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Thank you for being here. Um, so during our conversation, we will look at how technology is impacting art and art galleries, covering topics such as how the art and technology landscape has evolved, how digital technologies have changed how artists create their work, and how art galleries put on exhibitions, whether tech brings audiences closer to art, the impact of COVID-19, and what does the future look like for art and digital? Can they really mix? So there's a lot to cover, um, and it's great to have both an artist and art gallery uh, perspective to help us navigate these big topics. Um, but I think it will be really interesting to start our conversation um, by setting the scene uh, a little bit and putting art and tech into uh, a, a bit of context for our listeners. Um, so I'd like to begin by asking you both, um, how do you think the art landscape has changed, you know, particularly over the past 10, 20 years um, since tech now touches all parts of our lives? Um, and it will be great if you could talk about this in the context of your own work and your own experiences. Um, Laura, do you want to dive in on, on that uh, question? Sure. Well, I am, I'm a new artist, so I haven't been exposed to the art world for 20 years because I'm self-taught. I didn't go to school for art. And so it's all new to me, but <laughs> basically I think that the way it's changed the most for me is that I, at some point felt like I could be an artist and that was never gonna be an option for me or at least that's how I felt. I felt like the art world was this, you know, mysterious world that I would never be able to tap into or be a part of, even though I considered myself a creative my whole life and I was interested in creative endeavors and and artistic things. Um, but at some point, I think because of technology, I felt like this is something I might be able to do. And I might be able to learn and teach myself because I'm, you know, past college age and, and I don't know where else to go, you know, take classes on any of this stuff. And so because of that, I think that the art world has changed so much that there's just more people creating and feeling that confidence to, you know, make stuff and understand a little bit about what is going on out there in the art world and feeling like they could have, you know, some recognition and, um, and just the resources to create and learn. And so that's been amazing for me who, yeah, I went through college and it didn't major in art or anything like that. And then all of a sudden I was married and in my late 20s and I thought maybe I could actually do this and I started creating and teaching myself and googling and <laughs> spent a lot of time on YouTube and I kind of was able to learn my craft after practicing and from these resources. That's really amazing to hear actually Laura that technology really opened up these opportunities for you to explore your 
creative side and your artistry like that's a, a really incredible thing to to hear about and you you, you focus more on um the photography side of art with um collage mm -hmm. yeah so i do i that's how i basically started i would say i considered myself an artist officially when i started collaging and that's kind of when i started um selling more work but um yeah, I focus on photographic stuff, but since then I've moved into, I always will incorporate my photographs, but I, I also do mixed media and I've just, I think that I'm always excited about what, what I can do next and where I can take it. And so I kind of bug all the people in my close community of artists and ask a million questions and kind of you know, bribe them and say, I'll, uh, what do you want for a little <laughs> hour long session to just teach me this little skill so I can, so I can um, pursue it. So yeah, I'm kind of diving into all sorts of mediums lately. That's fantastic. Thank you, Laura. And Wells, yeah. from, from your perspective uh, in the art gallery world. Yeah, well, I, I would completely echo Laura's sentiment that technology has really kind of cast open in a really wonderful way who gets to be an artist and where and on what platforms I think exhibitions and by that I mean like a very um maybe typical exhibition format of like you walk into a museum you see a show there are pictures hung on the wall or sculptures in a gallery exhibitions used to be the primary way that art came to be known and understood by a public and one massive way that I think technology has changed the landscape is that that just isn't true anymore. That we as visitors or as learners or as people who come to experience art have so many different options for how we can choose to interact with it. The screen being a, a primary one at this point, I would say. And that also means that people who might not have gone through traditional routes of going to art school have a capability and an opportunity to almost self-market. And so artists are not just people who are working in studios anymore. They're also people who are making content in kind of a bleak way that can then get shared with the world. Um, there's also the point about technology, I think, informing and changing the ways that artists work. And I think artists have you know, since the beginning of time harnessed new technologies. They've always kind of been the first pioneers to take on the new thing, whether it's the new type of paint or using TV as a medium for the first time. And now that's really going into the digital sphere um, with artists who are making things that are very web-based or like integrated within social networks or use video or even social media platforms. Um, but the, the possibilities for the materials and the mediums the artists might use and how they might get stories across have just been cracked open. Yeah, I love that idea that, you know, using technology is, just, is actually just a natural evolution for artists to, you know, explore their creativity and to realise their artistic visions um, in, in the most sort of natural and best way possible for them to be able to um, communicate that to audiences as well through the use of technology. Because um, one of my sort of follow-up questions to this really was, you know, do, do artists sometimes see um, technology as intimidating or as a barrier, um, as something that they feel that, oh gosh, you know, this is the latest thing, I must incorporate it into my work and actually feel, you know, that that's actually quite um, a stressful thing um, to have to start thinking about in their, in their work. You know, I'm sort of thinking maybe if somebody um, is more of a, you know, a fine artist, you know, a painter, you know, and their, you know, their medium is, you know, the, the canvas oil and brush, you know, do they really want to start thinking about about, okay, do I need to start including augmented reality on my paintwork somehow? So um, I'd be interested to, to know if you have both um, encountered um, any, any artists who have had maybe um, not necessarily a negative experience with technology, but who are maybe slightly put off by it or not really sure how to in, incorporate this or whether they even should. Yeah, um, that's a really great thought and question because um, 
I, my answer is I hope not. I hope that somebody that is, you know, may use oils on canvas with a brush and uh, I hope they don't feel the pressure to integrate something that's not um, a natural part of their process. I, I think that if it's natural and you're curious and you're excited about it, then I think then, then I'm hoping artists are pursuing whatever's fueling their creativity. But otherwise, um, no, I, I, I love the idea of sticking to what is inspiring you and what's coming naturally. And, um, but I, I think it's a thing with content creation. Um, I think that there's a lot of people that are feeling this pressure to um, add technology and all these virtual, you know, things to their work or whatever to make it more, you know, of this wow factor. And um, I think it shows in the work if how, what their motivation is and what their intent is. And some of things feel gimmicky and they feel like it's just, you know, for to try and go viral and others feels genuine and creative and inspired. And so I, I think that that the intent always shows through. And um, I do have, so because I collage and I do a lot of hand cut collaging, I do have friends say to me, why don't you automate that? You know, like some of it can get kind of tedious and they say like, I bet you could do it on a, you know, a vinyl cutter or <laughs> laser machine or whatever. And, um, and that, that could be interesting at some point, but I tell them like, as of now, that, that is kind of the fun thing. I mean, that's kind of the process and that's kind of what I do. And so right now that's not interesting to me. I kind of like that I'm hand cutting and doing this thing for, for a long time, you know, and it's, it's fun. That's what I, <laughs> I like to do. So until I get cre curious about, um, kind of automating my hand cut collages I'll stick to what I'm doing I think that's a great answer for Laura thank you um Wells do you have anything to to add to that I just completely ag agree with Laura that I hope no artist really feels pressure to rush to using a technology be it in the work or in their self marketing and promotion I think a word that should 100% be banned from the artist vocabulary is should, you know, like it is the job of the artist to make the work that he, she, they is compelled to make. And then I really see my role as a curator and all other arts professionals as people to just be there in support of that vision. So if, if they are yeah, integrating technology because they think it's going to get them attention or they feel like it will make their work more um, consumable on any platform, you know, my advice would just be to say, don't just make what you need to make and the rest will be sorted out. I think that sounds imminently sensible <laughs> and thank you for giving such great answers to that question um and I was going to ask actually Wells like um you know does sometimes um artists um, incorporation of technologies into their artwork sometimes cause like um challenges for art galleries to actually show that work in in the best way um how, how uh, as as a curator how do you kind of go about dealing with that kind of situation being in, in, encountered with all of these new uh, technologies in artwork. Absolutely. Um, Whitechapel Gallery did an exhibition now six years ago, I think it was in 2014 or 15, that was called Electronic Superhighway. And it looked at artists who have really used technology in their work in a whole manner of ways from early experimentations with video in the 1970s to artists using sound pieces now. And I was not involved in the curation of that show, but it posed challenges because we had to get our hands on now defunct pieces of technology that had to be sourced from around the world. It required very intense maintenance, huge budgets. Um, and Whitechapel doesn't have a permanent collection, so I can't speak so directly to institutions that are collecting institutions and 
um, bring into their collections work that do involve technologies. But I know that conservationally, there is a whole field of research happening at the moment for how to preserve these works in such a way that a visitor who's encountering it 10, 15, 100 years from now might have an experience that can compare in the best possible way to one that they would have at the time of that work being made. Um, That's a huge a, challenge. A booming, <laughs> yeah, academic field that I think is working itself out, you know, as technologies develop. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge thing that I think as, uh, you know, audiences don't even think about is, you know, when when you're seeing a piece of um, art, which has a, a lot of technology in it, you know, somebody's got to look after that. Somebody's got to maintain that for the future. And like you said, for 100 years. Um, and that, yeah, that's absolutely something that we all need to start thinking about from a curatorial uh, perspective. Um, and yeah, I can only imagine the challenges that that brings with it. Um, and that actually really nicely uh, segues me on to the next kind of a topic area that I wanted to talk to you both about, which was um, talking more about audiences um, and art, um, and particularly how art, um, uh, how audiences are supposed to um, interact with art and how art is uh, to try and communicate with audiences. So I wanted to ask you both, you know, what do you think are the the best ways to communicate with audiences? And do you think that digital tools are effective in achieving this? Or are they a bit of bling culture kind of added on top of it to make audiences have that kind of initial wow factor? Just be really interesting to get both of your um, opinions on, on that. Yeah, I. it's interesting because I mentioned that I didn't consider myself in the art world or, or an artist for most of my life. And so I, I think that I always remember this experience when uh, my husband and I were visiting New York and uh, we just popped into a random gallery one time and just were exploring and we walked in and there was this exhibit that was this virtual reality exhibit. And um, so we put on these virtual reality, you know, whatever they're called, <laughs> headset. And um, I just, was taken to this different world that was just mind blowing to me. I was so inspired. I felt like I was on a high, just like going through this virtual reality experience. And um, it's interesting because we walked through this artist exhibit before we did the virtual reality experience at the end. And she had paintings and sculptures and all these things. And I just gave them no notice. Like, to be honest, I just didn't, they didn't like capture me at all. And I just was like, oh, whatever. And I walked to the back of the, the gallery. And when I experienced that, it was like, after I experienced that, then I like took my time with like each thing that she had and each piece. And I like read the write-ups. And so for me, I always go back to, to at least for me and my interests, that is what like made me a super fan of her work now. And I've like followed her on Instagram and I'm like, keep track of what she does. And I'm just like in love with her and all of her work and recently bought my first piece from her and was so excited. And I just think like, at least for whatever reason, her art was not, it didn't grab me, but that virtual reality experience just like transformed the way I felt about it. And obviously that's not to say, I think that that's like every artist needs this virtual reality experience by any means, but I think that yes, like it can be a tool that's used for such like so powerful, you know, to capture a, a certain type of audience or to bring your art to life if it lends itself to that. Absolutely. That's an amazing uh, example because um, sometimes, you know, people think that having, you know, VR um, in an art in an art gallery or in a, an exhibition space is distracting. But exactly as you said, it, it's a tool um, and, you know, it's it's there, I think, if people want to use it and to have that experience because it speaks to them, you know, they enjoy that kind of interaction, but also the artworks were there for people who maybe necessarily didn't want to have the VR experience, they could have that more um, 
traditional, I suppose, if you want to call it that, um, experience with the artworks and, and the labels and spending time in front of those artworks. But that's really amazing to hear that VR inspired you to um, enjoy this artist's work even more and to, you know, be, be a real fan of hers. Like, that, that's amazing to hear that, you know, VR helped you um, to have that um, incredible interaction with her work and to make it meaningful for you. Um, which is really amazing to hear. Uh, Wells, I'd love to hear your opinion uh, on yeah. this as well. Laura, I love that story so much because I think as, um, as a curator, I think I always have a fear essentially about the efficacy of technology sitting alongside a physical experience. And I'm always primarily actually thinking about a physical experience rather than a technological one, but it's great to hear how they can go together. Um, my sense with technology is that it can be used really powerfully, but it also can be used really terribly sometimes if, if I'm honest. And I like examples when it's used best when it either enhances a physical experience and helps you look again at the work as was Laura's case or approach it from a different angle. I think one of the things that's so powerful for me about a live in-person experience of art is that it can elicit responses on so many different levels be it like emotional, physical, intellectual, visceral. So when technology can help with that and can help in storytelling. Um, I think it's wonderful, but I do also carry fears about it eclipsing the actual work in some instances um, and, and fears too about, you know, this throws up big existential things for me about museums and, and what they're for, because I think we, a lot of people are still stuck, I think, on quite a traditional model of a museum really as being like a center for education or a kind of civic space. And what technology throws up is that actually they can be great leisure spaces and they can be spaces of intense entertainment. But I think a question is how museums can keep up because the rate of technological advancement is so huge and museums do not honestly have the budgets to keep up with that. And so my feeling is that any investment that museums and institutions make in harnessing devices, be it you know, screens or AR or VR or QR codes needs to enhance the experience for the audience in a way that serves the mission of the museum and also integrates kind of the lowest common denominator of visitors. So it can be as far reaching and accessible as possible. Absolutely. It's all about getting that balance in place and, you know, the sort of the goals of the, the art gallery or the museum. And as you said, the story they're trying to tell, because, um, you know, I've, I've read in so many reports about lots of museums and art galleries in particular, seeing themselves as safe as safe havens from technology. You know, they don't want this invasion of the kind of bling culture. This, they, they sort of see it sometimes as this low level medium for interaction. And, you know, they want to kind of keep uh, the art gallery and that sort of um, innate connection with the artwork that an individual is having or a group is having um, um, to a very, um, you know, um, you know, kind of core, core level. And they, they don't want that to be kind of um, broken in um, by technology. Um, I used to work in, in, in art galleries in the past and I worked for a small art gallery um, who were very worried about any type of technology being in the, in the art gallery itself. They had a very simple website and the website was genuinely just there to um, make audiences aware that the, the gallery existed and to sell tickets. That was it. There was really nothing else there at all. And, and that really was what the art gallery wanted. You know, they, they had a very clear goal and a very clear mission in mind as to um, how they wanted, um, you know, uh, audiences to interact with their artwork. Um, but I suppose given, you know, recent COVID-19 outbreak and, and everything, um, it's interesting to see how maybe some of those art galleries have had to um, adapt um, and, um, you know, what they've had to embrace 
um, which they may otherwise not have um, done in the past. Can I speak to that quickly, Fiona? Because I think, not to be too controversial of your previous employer, but I think that is just so misguided. Um, and I say that with confidence because there was a study that's now quite outdated, but it was from the National Endowments of the Arts in the United States that in they noticed that between 2002 and 2012, there was basically like a 6% decline in annual culture visitors in general. So to museums, theaters, live shows and experiences, which to me was staggering because at that rate of a 6% decline over a decade, by the time we get to the year 2060, there would just be no cultural visitors whatsoever. Museums would essentially be empty. And so I think, you know, that was now in 2012 and a lot of institutions have done a lot of work to think about how to bring people through the doors. But if, if the remit of the museum is to educate or is to tell stories, it seems to me so important that they use the voices and the platforms that are being harnessed by the zeitgeist at the time <laughs> to tell those stories and to bring people in. Yeah, I totally, I agree with you, Wells. It's, um, I just feel like if you're not doing that, why not? <laughs> you know, why, why aren't you? Um, it feels like it's, it should be the goal, I think, to help people fall in love with art and help people continue to love art. You know, if you're in the camp where you already love it, then um, great and you'll continue to love it. And that will, you know, that will be fed that passion. And if you don't care about art at all and you're being drugged into a museum by your parents or by your partner or whatever, um, hopefully you're just using all the resources in the current times to foster this like enjoyment of art and what it can offer and that it feels you know exciting and current and fun yeah absolutely and I think this time has been of COVID and of museums really actually rushing to get a lot of things in digital spaces particularly on social media has been really interesting because it has shown that people really care about museums, digital presences and what content they are putting out there. And so it's not a futile exercise, I think, in, in looking very closely, essentially, at how the stories that you're telling online and with digital technologies can can be serving your mission. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking specifically of a lot of conversation that was happening around the time of Black Lives Matter when there was a lot of pressure on museums to speak out basically against the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And people wanted to know that as visitors to those institutions, those institutions were aware of the roles that they had played in upholding racist systems. And they wanted, you know, visitors wanted transparency and, and wanted museums to work harder and use the digital platforms to make those demands. And um, that for me really just went to show that, that this digital space as we're talking about it quite nebulously is incredibly powerful and people are invested in it. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to, to ask you both actually a bit more um, about COVID-19. I mean, we can't really ignore the elephant in, in the room, I think. Um, and I was um, really interested to kind of get your opinions on, you know, um, has, you know, there been a kind of rapid uptake and acceptance of, of digital and tech um, in art galleries and maybe for some artists as well. Um, and is this potentially, do you think, like just a short term response to COVID? Because in real life experiences are either gone or very minimal, or 
you know, has it actually sped up a trend that was already there? You know, and what does this kind of mean for things going forward? I can take that one initially. Um, I, I think it, it's very different for lots of institutions. Some already had very robust digital programs museums in the US, I think, are quite ahead in this department. A lot of them have dedicated digital teams. They've thought of their website and their social media presences as their second locations. You know, they really harness them as places that people will visit. But I think you're right in saying that other institutions have rushed to get content online and what they are putting online may, may end up being temporary and that's because this is a period of experimentation for them they're seeing what their audiences are responding to they're figuring out how to tell stories about the art that's in the physical space in a way that delights and surprises and um, elicits emotional responses and not every institution I think has been able to get it right yet um, and I think a big part of this as well, and I hate to bring up money, but it will be money. And the viability of these programs after COVID is going to be so dependent on, firstly, visitors still coming through the doors and being willing to see exhibitions and buy tickets, which will feed back in to the kind of financial health and ecosystem of those organizations. Um, but it will also really rely on funders and, you know, they, I think, sometimes can specify where they want their money to go. And if there's a big push and there's a lot of money available for digital programs, I think they'll probably continue to exist. But if, if there aren't, because institutions, especially in the UK, are struggling so much to keep their head above water and stay afloat, I think... Um, Unfortunately, it may be an area where if there aren't resources available, you know, online programs would have to be scaled back. Yeah, I'm in the, I'm in this, I, I don't know position because I, I, I'm not as familiar with that world and what's happening behind the scenes. And so that's interesting to hear Wells thoughts on that. Um, I'm hoping hoping, hoping that everyone pulls through so that we can still continue to visit in person. Of course, I never want that to go away. I want museums and galleries to be able to keep their doors open because, I mean, it just goes without saying that experiencing art in person is, is unlike experiencing art virtually. And they're both really great and they have, you know, they can both be um, really powerful experiences, but I just, yeah, I'm interested to see where it goes. I'm, I think that I'm impressed by the, the pivot of some institutions, um, and the ability to adjust so well and so quickly. Um, and at the same time, hope that they can still maintain what they originally were doing and their, um, but, yeah, maybe it's possible to maintain both. And maybe that will be the, the case moving forward is that these institutions will have to figure out how to have kind of both presences. Um, but I'm interested to see where it goes. Yeah, it feels very much like it's um, a kind of a big learning curve for um, for everyone really in, in, the, in the whole art and culture sector. You know, every, like you said, Laura, everybody's had to pivot um, and some people have done it really well um, and some people it's been less well done, but it is a massive learning curve for everyone. And it's, you know, an experiment to kind of see what works and what doesn't work um, for the long term. Um, and I also feel that um, digital in a way, um, because it's had such an impact on the arts and culture sector, you know, in 2020 and still now into 2021, it's, it's not just going to go away immediately. Uh, as soon as we're allowed back into art galleries. So it's kind of looking at that, uh, as we've been discussing, that more kind of balanced approach of, you know, how can digital sort of supplement the in real life experience of still going to that art gallery and having that uh, meaningful uh, 
connection uh, with that artwork in person. I mean, at the moment, I work in the music industry and it's a very similar problem. It's like, how, how can you recreate a, a live concert experience from your living room? Um, and yes, you can hear the music in the same way, you can watch it, but you're not experiencing it with, with other people that somehow that uh, innate connection is, is missing somewhere. Um, and I feel that that's maybe what's coming out in this conversation is that we still need to see and be near and be close to, to that artwork in that art gallery um, to have our own personal experience um, with that piece of art. So it's really, yeah, it's gonna be an interesting um, few years, I think, to see how um, digital and in real life experiences mix. Wells. <laughs> Well, I, I was just going to add to that, that one of the things that COVID has really brought forward for me in not just experiencing art itself and objects themselves, but it's more actually stories about those objects, but is how much of that experience is actually not very sociable, right? It's like me or you with your device and there isn't a sense of connection really and one thing that I find fascinating is that uh, the UK has this agency essentially called the audience agency which does surveys with institutions across the country and people the number one reason why people visit museums in the UK is for social interaction that was like it got 29 percent of all the various reasons why the second was to learn and the third was for entertainment um, and I think there's this element of the social that as you say really can't be can't be replaced and that that brings us together and there was um, this incredible story of a university here UCL did a study in 2017 where it noticed that as people experience is looking at theater but I'd be fascinated to know if this could happen with art as well but as people are watching and experiencing theater together they not only have the same or similar emotional reactions but their hearts literally come to beat in sync and I just loved that so much as an argument for why our doors need to stay open in times of war, times of crisis, um, not during pandemics when they're highly contagious, but it, it just felt like a great argument for this like collective empathy that these experiences might be able to foster. I'm obsessed with that, that the, the heart's beating in sync just makes my heart sore out of my chest. <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah, I'm with you. I just, I, people crave it and need it. <laughs> I just, it's, it's unlike any other experience, I think, and it, it, all the arts, you know, a concert or whatever, it's just an energy among people that, that is really, really hard to obviously, um, produce <laughs> when, it, when we can't be in person and, um, I have seen some artists at, and some friends of mine try, and I appreciate the efforts. I really, I feel like there have been some artists where I'm like, they gave me as good of a, as an experience walking me through their show that is now virtual or whatever. And I, there's been some people that have done a really good job and gotten really creative. And one thing I've noticed is that, um, so when I go into a show or a, a gallery or a museum or whatever, and I'm really, I'm reading about, you know, the works and I'm, I'm just understanding and there's people around kind of talking about it and you might feel the confidence to interject and say, oh, I, I thought that too, or whatever. Um, I've seen some artists kind of try and recreate that by just saying like, I'm going to like walk you through the process and, and what these mean. And I'd love like, you know, live feedback. And I'd love to answer your questions and give me your honest, you know, feelings about this show. And those have been kind of fun. And I've just been like appreciative of that because I'm like, okay, that's, it's not the same, but it's, it's what we have right now. And it's great. I would love to, I'm, I'm sitting on my couch anyways. I might as well tune in 
and um, go look at this art show. Oh, I love that. It's, um, yeah, exactly. I love that. It's more like a kind of experiential experience of, of art and almost having that behind the scenes um, access to something happening live in front of you. I mean, that, that, that's an incredible experience to see. I, I love that. I, I want to go to one. <laughs> so it would be incredible. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to move on to one last thing before we um, come to the end of our conversation. And, and that was really to kind of um, ask you both, um, are there any technologies um, which are really um, exciting you that could be used in, in artwork or in, in art galleries? And, and if you had any examples of where you've, you know, been to an exhibition or experienced a piece of art, which, um, you know, which used technology or an interesting balance of uh, technology that really elevated the experience for you. it will be really interesting to, to hear your opinions. Oh, th th this is a hard one for me because I think um, my fascination with technology is more from a curatorial perspective. So to see how artists are using it and harnessing it in new ways and, and intervening with it and challenging it and pushing it along. Um, and the scope for that is, is just massive. Um, so I, I can't say specifically that there's like one new thing, be it a software or a hardware that, you know, sparks my interest right now. I think I'm more artist led rather than technology led. But I think on thinking about audiences and ways in which museums can use technology to engage audiences, um, what I am finding most interesting at the moment is actually just old school video content and how that can be used as a really compelling storytelling mechanism and it doesn't have to be super shiny and super you know blingy um to use your term Fiona I think for me it's it's the ability of video to capture a narrative that can then come to enhance someone's physical experience and invite them to look at that work again. Um, that's, I think, where I will be pouring my energies as we move forward. Yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm with Wells in the sense that I'm, I'm definitely more artist led as well. I don't know what is all out there to be excited about. I feel like it's an overwhelming world. And, um, but it is exciting to me. I just think like when something pops up and I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that that existed or that that was, you know, a thing to, to do. It's, it excites me. Um, but this is, this is pretty timely because just yesterday I met with two friends of mine who are very immersed in the tech world and they, they're kind of artists in their own right, even though they don't consider themselves artists, but I look at them as just like, you're geniuses. I don't know any of this stuff. And they were, we had this meeting yesterday because we're going to create this kind of exhibit pop-up shop and just locally here and that we're really excited about. And it's, a, it's fun because I have all these ideas of artwork to, to create and ideas like that. And they are like, well, let's do it this way. Let's add this technology or the things I don't even know existed. Um, and it's just been so fun. They came up with this idea to, so I make these like landscape collages, you know, and they, they said it would be fun to have, you know, all these options of the different landscapes people can choose on the screen and they can choose their landscape and then they can choose their different sky and they can kind of create their own digital collage and then press print and they can go print out their piece of art that they just made. And I would have never thought of that. I would have just been like, well, maybe we can have them cut and paint, you know, and they're taking it to this level of, um, you know, adding technology that seems so fun to me. And it would just be like a fun experience to go in and, and, and do this. Um, so yeah, I, I'm just, I'm kind of here for the ride. I'm just seeing like where this goes, what people are doing, 
I don't have a, a tech technology advanced mindset. I I'm just, I'm excited about what I see, but, um, that's it. I just am kind of like, take me along. Let me, <laughs> let me see where, where these people that are, you know, that understand it more, um, what they have to offer. I'm so stoked. That sounds amazing. I, I, I wish I lived in, uh, Utah, so I could come and make my own collage. <laughs> that would be really cool. Um, so thank you. Um, so just we're coming to the to the end now. So um, I just wanted to finish off with uh, two final questions for you both. So the first one is, um, where do you think technology and digital sort of sit in the the art landscape of the future? And you can go crazy with this question. <laughs> Oh, okay. I think, um, well, my technology art utopia is what I'll, I'll paint for you. I'm not sure if that's what will materialize, but I think this future world will involve artists harnessing all the various technologies that are available to them as they have always and in the past. Um, and it will also involve, I hope, a scenario in which museums using technology to enhance a live or physical experience in a way that can stay relevant. Um, the kind of bleak flip side to that is that the world of social media is so saturated with content and materials every day and is so incredibly fast paced. So I think there's um, a very possible dystopia that might emerge of a lot of money being spent to create a lot of experiences that would sit alongside visiting an exhibition or seeing art that then are used once and immediately are not relevant anymore or no one cares about the next day. And that for me would be incredibly, incredibly sad. I think, I, I think you're right. I think that there's, I think that it will be a roller coaster in the sense that just like blogging, was, you know, people were just hyper on blogs and then it just became like every every boring person and exciting person had a blog, right? It just didn't matter if you had anything to say. We had a blog and we read vlogs and we consumed and we consumed and then we were like, we want something pure. We want something, you know, we were so inundated with all this, you know, information and we kind of craved, you know, the way blogs were in 2000 whatever and it's just I think that these kind of things that have to keep up you know these technologies these methods of marketing these experiences they tend to course correct and go okay maybe we don't have to you know jump at every opportunity or trend or whatever to um to maintain what we have going and so I think my prediction is that it will just kind of be this up and down, you know, ebb and flow of like uh, trying too hard maybe, and, you know, having some of that succeed and the, the work and the efforts pay off. And then I think that we'll kind of want and crave traditional ways of experiencing art and creating art. And it, I think, that's my prediction. I think it will just kind of, you know, ebb and flow and go up and down and we'll forever be figuring this out. <laughs> we'll forever be kind of experiencing it in these, you know, kind of new innovative and then traditional, quote unquote, traditional ways. And we'll see. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, the final question for you both, looping us back to our title of oil and water, can art and digital mix? So do you think art and digital can mix? In a sentence, if you can. 
Absolutely. That's, <laughs> that's my answer. Yeah, I think they can. And I think they do all the time. Ditto. Thank you to Laura and Wells for their amazing insights on how technology and digital is impacting the art and art gallery worlds. If you enjoyed this episode of The Culture Bar, please hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode.